Thank you for coming to our another Clean Call Talks. And we are going to today talk about global state and uh, basically the idea of singletons, which is a form of global states, um, and uh, en encapsulation and how singletons make your API really deceptive and uh, how this really makes the whole thing really difficult from a testing point of view. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so global state, uh, you know, I like to point out that somebody once told me that this definition of insanity, which is that you repeat the same thing and you expect a different results. And singletons allow you to do this. Singletons allow you to repeat the same thing and keep getting the different results, which will slowly drive you insane. So let me uh, point this out. Suppose I have a class X and there's a method that does something and computes a value called int. And I'm going to instantiate it twice. And I'm going to call the method twice. That way I'll have the A and B uh, uh, value. Now here's the question. Does A equal B or not necessarily? What do you guys think? So you don't think it has to, OK? Let me ask it slightly differently. Which code would you rather be in? In the code where the two are equal or in the code where the two are not equal? where they are equal. So you would much prefer to be in the code base where it's equal. And so I'm going to agree with you. I think the same exact way that if you have uh, a, uh, if you basically do the same operation twice, I very much would like to get the same exact results. So the thing is that the object state is transient and subject to cover. Yes. So one thing is that and could, you, could I trouble you to use the microphone because we're recording this? So one thing is that the function was called do something. So do something doesn't tell you whether it's only getting something or doing something. And if it does something, then it doesn't you could matter argue actually. That the values could be different. Okay, it, that actually doesn't matter. Like, the fact like that it's add called to add to a like container or uh, 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 size or whatever. Yeah. Yes, it actually doesn't matter. Uh, the key over here is that. There is no information flowing into the system, right? There is nothing I'm passing through the constructor, and there is nothing I'm passing through the methods. And therefore, whatever is being computed, um, and because this is a computer, which is a final state machine, it better produce the same exact results every single time I run this. And if it doesn't produce the same result every single time I run this, that means there is some global state. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So here's the thing. Object state is transient and it's subject to garbage collection, right? Which means if you lose a reference, everything inside of it goes away. And this is a good thing. Now, a class state is something very different. The class state is persistent to the lifetime of the JVM. Yes, Isaac. I, to break your flow, but, um, I just wanted to point out that, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean global state, right? Because it could be something coming in from the outside world. That's a global state, too, actually. We'll get there in a second. Man, you guys are today very much ahead of, of, of me. Um, all right. So class state, on the other hand, is persistent. Right? This is where you use the static keyword. And you basically are tying the value not to the instance, but basically to the whole JVM. Um, so let me point, look at this thing a little further. If I do new x, I'm basically building some graph of objects. Though the X constructor can instantiate a whole bunch of other objects and so on and so forth, then some graph of objects gets built. So if I do new X again, I again am constructing some graph of objects, and it better be the same object graph. Because I didn't specify any other parameters, right? There's not, no other input coming from the outside. So now if I do the two operations, I better get the same value. If I don't get the same value, that means that those two graphs are secretly talking to each other. And then the, the fact that they're talking to each other secretly is what the problem is here. It's not explicit. It's hidden. And it creates all kinds of mis, uh, mishap in our code base. And it's what will drive you eventually insane and crazy, because you will keep on doing the same operation, and different things will be happening. We, in other words, there is something that's getting into the system, something that's being persisted between invocations that's causing this. And I'm going to argue that this kind of way of coding actually makes it a lot worse to understand the system, to understand how to debug it, to find bugs, and so on and so forth. So if you have global state, you're basically in a situation where multiple executions can produce different results. 
And as a result of that, if you're running tests, your tests are flaky. You run a test once, it works. You run it again, it fails. You run it again, it passes. And that kind of test is really hard to debug. And then, you, of course, you have to ask yourself, a test is supposed to have a control over all the parameters. So if I run the test over and over and over again, it's consistent, right? Either the code works or it doesn't. The fact that it's flip-flopping back and forth and it's flaky really implies that somewhere there's global state, something that we don't fully control from the testing point of view. It also means that the order of the test matters. So if I run the test in isolation, the test passes. If I run it as part of the test suite, it no longer passes because one test sets some global state, another test expects the global state to be in a certain state and it isn't, and all of a sudden your tests are starting to fail. And it also means that you cannot run the test in parallel. You know, if you have a multi-threaded CPU, it would be great if you could run all the different tests on different threads, but because there's global state, these tests can talk to each other uh, in the back uh, through some singletons, and as a result, you can't do that. Now, there is, some, there is even a worse format of this thing, and that is you have a test that uh, passes to, uh, together, but uh, if, you have a, if you have a test as part of a suite, and let's say your suite takes an hour to run, and the last test in the suite fails, and you're trying to debug it, and you try to run it in isolation, and it passes. Right? Good luck debugging anything like that. So from a testing point of view, global state is really a horrible problem for us. And we try to avoid it uh, as much as we can. Now, there's a couple of hidden global state inside of the JVM. Uh, something that you might not think about, but there is system that current time. There is some secret process going on in the background that secretly updates this global variable called the current time, and it's being updated continuously. And this can cause flakiness if you expect certain things to be returned from your current time. Uh, same thing as new date, right? New date internally calls the system that current time, and so the global state now is inside of date as well. Uh, another one is math random. Uh, there's no such thing as random in, in software, uh, but there is pseudo-random sequences. And in order for the pseudo-random sequence to happen, it has to be initialized by some kind of a seed. And so internally, the math function keeps hold of this seed, and every time you call math.random, it uses the seed to generate the next pseudo-random sequence. Um, otherwise, random will always return the same value. So the, the seed itself is, is somewhere secretly global. And so I'm going to make an argument that if you have code that uses any of these things, you will have hard time writing tests for these, a really hard time. Uh, tests will be flaky. You can't run them in isolation. Maybe you can't run them as part of the suite. The order of the test will matter, and so on and so forth. Um, how many of you guys have test suites that are flaky? Oh, come on, I can't believe nobody has them. All right, that's better. Uh, and I'm gonna argue that uh, all of your flakiness will come basically from some form of uncontrolled global state. So let's talk about singletons for a second. So people say, there is an object that I only really need to have a single instance of something inside of my JVM. Because typically, you have one application per JVM, and the application only needs a single instance of an object. And so they say, OK, because I only have one application per JVM, therefore, I'm going to instantiate the object and put a reference into the global space. That's what a singleton is, right? Singleton has a dot get instance method that has instance field, which is attached to the global space, which is part of the class, which means it's no longer subject to garbage collection and so on and so forth. But here, it is, here is the problem from a testing point of view. In the test, each test basically wants to instantiate a small portion of your application. It wants to apply some stimulus to it. It wants to assert something. And then it wants to basically take whatever it had and throw it away. That's what the garbage collector is for, right? It just wants to be garbage collected. And then the next test runs. And that test instantiates a small portion of your application, applies some stimulus, and throws it away. And then the next test goes on, right? When you have a global state that's part of the JVM, unless you run every single test in a separate JVM, which we don't for performance reasons, uh, it doesn't really work, does it? So you really want to make sure that you, you don't have any singletons that are tied to JVM. And this is where the ambiguity kind of comes into play. And I like to differentiate it 
as in singleton, the capital S, and singleton, the lowercase s. If we, if we use capital letters for the names of something. So if you have the design pattern singleton, uh, then we are referring to the fact that uh, the singleton has a private constructor and it has a global instance variable, right? That's what the design pattern says it is. There's also the, the idea of a lowercase singleton with lowercase s, meaning that I only have a single instance of something. But that instance does not have a private constructor and it's not attached to the global namespace. I only have a single instance of it because I only called the new operator once. Those are two kind of very distinct uh, things. So I like to differentiate them, singleton with big S and the singleton with lowercase s. Or the good singleton versus the bad singleton. So let's talk about the classical singleton with capital S. Suppose you have a class called app settings, and most applications have something like this. Uh, they have that the global field called the instance, which is declared with the keyword static, which is what makes it global. And it instantiates the class inline by calling the new operator on it directly. And then we have a, a private constructor so that nobody else can make a copy of this. This is classical singleton, right? You guys all agree, right? Uh, so let me ask a question now, and that is, how many global variables do you see uh, on the screen? So you said three, you said, or to state one, two, and three? Is that what you're saying? Four. Um, correct, yes, four because of instance, yes. Uh, actually, I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to say it's, in theory, infinite. Because the state one can have a pointer to an object, which internally can have state, and that object can have a pointer to another object, and that can have state, and so on and so forth. And so, really, it's infinite number of different variables that can possibly affect the execution of my code. So the problem with global state is that it's transitive, right? Once, uh, once you cross a global variable, which in this particular case is the instance field by calling the get instance, everything behind that, everything that's accessible from that global variable is global as well. Now let me ask, over here, how many people think that global variables is a good idea? <coughs> no one. How many people think singletons are a good idea? Uh, people are raising their hands. OK, so what gives? I just proved to you that singletons make a whole bunch of global variables. And um, you're telling me singletons are a good thing, but you all agree that global variables are a bad thing. So think about it. Now here's the next problem. Uh, because the test doesn't control the instantiation of the object, and we, we kind of covered this in previous talks, how it is important that the test can instantiate a small portion of your application, apply some stimulus and assert something, right? The test needs to be in control of the instantiation process. Here, the tests are not in control of the instantiation process, and therefore the test can never get a hold of the state one, two, and three. And because the, the tests cannot get a hold of the state, there's no way to assert anything, there's no way to reset anything, and there's no way to work with this in any way. So what most people do is they'll have custom methods that are for test only. How many of you guys have done that? Good. So in other words, we took a singleton design pattern where we fought really hard to make sure that it's singleton and only one instance is in there, which means private constructor and global variable. And then we secretly put in a whole bunch of backdoors so that we could replace it at runtime for testing purposes and modify it and get a hold of that, right? So I mean, isn't that kind of weird? Like you want to make sure and then you don't want to make sure? Like choose your battle, pick what you want and stick with it, right? Uh, and in this particular case, the problem really is that from a testing point of view, you want to instantiate a whole bunch of small little tiny subsets of your application and do something with them. Um, and we kind of already covered this, right? That the internal state of a singleton becomes globally accessible. In other words, you have a whole bunch of global variables as far as uh, the code is concerned. And we all know all the badness of global variables. So, Let's look at a code that uses singleton. Suppose you have some uh, method, some kind of class called app, and there's a method on it, and the method calls app settings.getinstance.doX. How do I test this? 
Any thoughts out there? How do I assert that do x actually gets called? You cannot. There's no seams, right? In order for us to assert something, we need to have seams. And again, we talked about this earlier, that you need to be able to uh, instantiate the class under test, and you need to have control not just of the instantiation of the class under test, but you also have to have control over the instantiation of the class under test dependency or its collaborators, right? In this case, the class app collaborates with app settings. But in order to get a hold of the collaborator, it doesn't ask for the collaborator through the constructor. It do, instead, it reaches into a global variable, gets a hold of the collaborator, and then collaborates with it. And this makes testing essentially impossible. Now, usually, again, the way people solve this is they'll have a special for the test method which says app settings dot set instance. And they undo their singletonness be, uh, property that they fought so hard to introducing. So let's see what we can do. How about we uh, make it so that it's public app settings. So I understand that within your application, you only need a single instance of app settings class. Uh, but the requirement is that the single application needs a single instance. The requirement is not that a single JVM needs a single instance. Now, it is true that in most cases, you're only running a single app inside of your JVM, but it's not true for tests. Each test is a small sub, uh, sub portion of your application being instantiated. And if that section of the application needs to get a hold of the app settings, it wants to control how it gets instantiated, it wants to set things on it, and once it's done setting things, it wants to be able to throw it away. In other words, the garbage collector should be able to get rid of it. So um, what we're changing here is that the class no longer enforces its own singletonness. And this is the key. This is really where the problem is from singleton's point of view. If classes enforce their own singletonness, all kinds of hard things happen from a testing point of view. Uh, we have to basically have some other way of making sure that our application only creates one instance of it, because the application only needs one instance. But it's not because we enforce it through a private and a global variable. Instead we do so by simply making sure we only call the constructor once. That's a different topic. Um, so now, in this case, we can inject the app settings into the app class, and then we can call the settings.doX. Now, from a testing point of view, I know how to test this, because I can instantiate the app, and I can instantiate the app settings maybe with the correct state, or maybe I can instantiate a subclass of app settings, which will be my mock. Or maybe I can use EasyMock or JMock to put a app settings in its place. The point is, from a testing point of view, I have a choice. I can do all these different things. Then I can call the method under test, and I can assert that the right stuff happened. So singletons are the one greatest evil that makes your code absolutely untestable. Now, but it gets worse. Have you ever seen APIs that lie about what they do? Let me show you some pretty uh, deceptive API. So once upon a time, I was on a project and I wrote this particular uh, test. And it said, new credit card, and I had to pass in some numbers. And I said, credit card that charge $100. And of course, the credit card constructor insisted that the credit card number be valid. So I had to, closest credit card number I could find was my own wallet. And I ran this test. And wouldn't you know it, on the end of the month, I got a bill and I was out of $100. This is what we call by spooky action at a distance. Here's the thing. How did the credit card know how to talk to the server? How did it know where the server was? How did it know how to authenticate? How did it know who was the person to be charged? How did it know what the account was? Like all these questions are hidden, right? It just sort of happened and it worked. Now, actually, it's more complicated than that because the test never really passed in isolation. It only passed as part of a suite. Whenever I ran it out of a suite, I was out of 100 bucks. When I ran it in isolation, uh, I actually get some weird null pointer exception. 
I didn't know why I was getting no pointer exception, so instead I went to talk to the wiser and older members of the team. And I said, uh, I'm trying to do this. What's going on? Can you help me out? And they said, oh, well, come on, man. You should know this. You need to call credit card processor.init. Really? How was I supposed to know this? The APIs didn't tell me that I had to know this. It just kind of, I had to do this. OK, so I wrote credit card.init. I passed the whole parameters to it. And uh, I ran it. And um, I got a, another exception. This time in a different location, so I was making progress, and I said, OK, now what do I do? So again, I went to the older and wiser, and they said, oh, yeah, the credit card processor actually needs to use uh, offline queue, and so you better call offline queue.start. Again, that wasn't obvious to me. Like, how was I supposed to know this? So I did that, and I ran the test again, and wouldn't you know it, I got another exception again. So again, I went to older and wiser, and I said, uh, what am I doing wrong here? I, I can't figure this out. And they said, well, come on, man. Uh, offline queue needs a database. Really? Like, how was I supposed to know this? Uh, and so when I passed in the database, then the test ran, and I was under, out of 100 bucks again. So the, now look at this thing a little further. The credit card is lying to us. It basically says it pretends to not need the credit card processor, even though in reality it does. Right? The code didn't work without the credit card processor, but the credit card didn't say it needed it. Nowhere in the constructor did it, does it say, I need to get a hold of credit card processor. Nowhere in the method calls is there a setter on a credit card processor. There is no way for me to know that a credit card processor is needed. But it gets worse. If I initialize credit card processor, again, I have no way of knowing that the credit card processor needs an offline queue. And it gets worse. If I initialize the offline queue, there is no way for me to know that I need to get a hold of database. These things are just are the way they are, and you don't know. Now, in a real system, you don't have three singletons, or even four, or five. You have hundreds of them. And they all have to be initialized in the correct order. Have you ever seen the main method of most of the applications, where all the singletons get initialized? It's like black magic. Like nobody knows what's going on in there. Like in some bizarre order, they have to get initialized. And if you change the order, nothing works. Are you guys agreeing with this, or have you never seen an initialization of a main method like that? Now here's another problem. I write the code, I leave. Somebody else comes after me and look at, looks at this and says, looks at this red part and looks at the green part and says, I don't think those two things are related in any particular way. As a matter of fact, I think I can rearrange them because I think it's going to improve the performance or something or other. I have some reason why I want to rearrange the code and change the, the lines of code. And I think I'm allowed to do that because there's no parameters getting passed in, no states getting passed in. I should be able to rearrange this. Uh, maybe I can change the order of things. You think that's going to work? It's not, right? So here's the thing. that Here's the assumption that I would like to make. And that is, if I have a code like this, when I simply instantiate A and B and I perform some operations on it, uh, I would significantly prefer to work on a project where I can freely rearrange the order of things. And I expect the order to still work. And the reason I'm allowed to rearrange things is because the only dependency, as far as I'm concerned, between A and B is on the method Y. When it says, in order to call method Y, you need to pass in the method B. So clearly, I better be calling the method on B, right? But it doesn't say that A has to be instantiated before B or vice versa. It also doesn't force me to call A.x before I call B.z, right? All of these things, I should be independent about calling them in any order I want. And the only way I can assert that is if there is no global state. In other words, the only way two objects can talk to each other is if I have specifically allow them to talk to each other by passing a reference. If I pass a reference from A to B, then A is allowed to talk to B. If I don't pass reference between these two objects, then they are in two independent graphs. And that's a good world to be in. It, it makes our cognitive load a lot much better. Now. Here comes dependency injection, and it, it's the thing that solves this particular problem. What if 
you know, we come back to our test again. You know, we have all this static initialization on the bottom and all this credit card thing on, on the bottom of there. What if uh, I, okay, so we kind of said we, we can't change the order over here, right? Because that's not gonna work. Uh, but let's get back to this thing here. What if instead of new credit card, where inside of the credit card somewhere secretly I say credit card processor dot get instance, what if I simply said, um, I asked for the credit card processor in the constructor. See how it says so, new credit card, here's the credit card number, and I asked for the credit card processor in the constructor. When I did, if I would have done this, and some new person comes onto project and he wants to instantiate a credit card, there's no black magic going on. The credit card says, I need a credit card processor. It declares it explicitly. There is no hidden secret communication channel between the credit card processor and credit card. It's explicit. It is clearly stated what it is. So you go in and you say, hey, credit card processor, new credit card processor. And look what happens over there. The credit card processor says, but I need a queue. Again, no secret channel of communication, explicit. It says, this is what I need. So I'm going to do new offline queue. And that says, but I need a database. So you say, no problem. I'm going to instantiate a database. And you go on and on and on until the whole thing is uh, provided for you. Now here is what happens over here. Notice I cannot rearrange the order of things anymore. It's very explicit in what I need to get my job done. And it also is not possible for me to say new credit card processor before I call the new database. It simply doesn't work. It won't compile. So dependency injection is actually your friend when it comes to initialization. And if you don't have global state, and everybody asks for things explicitly in their constructors, your main method becomes a lot clearer. You know who needs what in which order. Like all the mystery disappears. As a matter of fact, if you try to initialize things in the wrong order, it won't even compile. Do you guys see how that kind of helps out? So the coolest part of it is the dependency injection enforces the order of initialization at compile time. And this is a big plus. This is a really a big plus. It really helps when a new person comes onto project and looks at the code and says, I know in which order things have to be initialized, because I can't do it the wrong way. It also allows me to test things in isolation. Uh, for example, if I wanted to write this, and it said I need a credit card processor in order to get my work done, I could have stopped over there and said, hmm, maybe instead of instantiating the real credit card processor, I'm going to create a mock of a credit card and pass you a mock. And then I simply cut the whole uh, dependency right, right there. And I'm going to test now credit card in isolation. And now, by providing a mock, I can prevent my $100 disappearing out of my wallet every time I run the test. But maybe I'm going to say to myself, nah, maybe that's not a good place to place a mock. Maybe I want to have a real credit card processor, a real offline queue, but a fake database. Or vice versa, right? You, you have a choice. The point is uh, that by doing explicit dependency injection, you have a choice where you want to draw the line. And these choices is what, is what makes the testing much easier. So I'm going to argue that global state is kind of the root of all of your testing problems. Not all of them. Actually, that's kind of maybe a little too strong. But it's good 90% of them. Uh, the other one is uh, structuring your code properly. But most of the times, most of the times when, we, when we're having a really hard time instantiating objects, et cetera, is because there's some secret global state that allows us two, two objects to communicate without actually knowing about each other. Um, and the problem with global state is, well, it cannot really be controlled from the tests. And if you do want to control it, then we have to put all kinds of setter methods, and then we have to remember to clean up after ourselves. And it's also a problem because it's very easy for people to add new global state. You know? So maybe you write a test, and you remember to set up your test correctly, and then clean up the global state after yourself. But then somebody else comes along and adds a new global variable, and it affects you in some way, and you're not sure, you don't know about it, and you don't know which test you have to go and change to make it work again. 
And so singletons is this common form of encapsulating global state. It's, it's this weirdness which allows us all to basically say, yeah, global state sucks. But singletons, I love. Like, what gives here? Like, singletons are, are like the global state in sheep's clothing. Like, they pretend to be OO. Hey, look, there's only one s static variable called the instance somewhere at the root of the object tree. But guess what? That static instance variable is transitive. It makes everything else below global as well. And, you know, again, there's a difference between singleton as in there's only one instance of this class in the object and singleton, which enforces its own singleton-ness through a private constructor and uh, a global variable instance method. There's nothing wrong with having a single instance of something. It only becomes a problem when it's tied to global state. <clears throat> and we already talked about the fact that sing a global state is transitive. <clears throat> so I'm going to open up to questions. So in one of my programs, um, there's... Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, there's there's a, a widget where it uh, will show messages for various things that are happening, errors mm -hmm. that have occurred, warnings, whatever. Um, and at the moment, it is stored as a static global thing. Um, and that way, it's accessible from anywhere. I can just, you know, show a message. Mm -hmm. But if I don't do that, then... You know, I might be somewhere way down deep someplace, and I need to show a message. Now, in order to get at that thing, if I want to do it this way, I have to go back through all the dependencies and make that a, something that gets passed in all the way up the chain, and that seems some, somehow excessive. Like, yes, is so this is like bad. This, uh, <laughs> yes, it is bad, and this is a very common myth. So basically, the problem is that. Uh, you need a singleton like a database somewhere in the bottom of your application because it's the bottom layer that talks to the database or name your own singleton. And then you have all these layers on top of it. And so clearly you're going to instantiate and initialize the database somewhere inside of the main method. right? And that question becomes, uh, don't I have to pass the database through every single thing all the way to the bottom? And the answer is, no, you do not. The reason for that is because you're mixing two things. Uh, I'm assuming that in your code, you simply, when you need an object, you simply instantiate it. OK, when you instantiate an object inline, <clears throat> you're mixing uh, the responsibility of construction with the responsibility of doing business logic. And this is, a, this is a problem on multiple levels. First of all, I can never mock out the object you instantiate inline. It also means that your call graph and your object instantiation graph are pretty much the same. So whoever you're calling is also whoever you're instantiating, or vice versa. Whoever you're instantiating, you're also the people who you're calling. Now, if you separate them out and say, I am not in the business of instantiation, <clears throat> I am only in the business of uh, getting a whole, uh, I'm only in the business of doing the business logic, and you simply declare in your constructor, I need a database, then the person above you, the layer above you, is not responsible for calling the new operator on it, which means it's not responsible for uh, worrying about the database. So the layer at the bottom can say, hey, I need a database in this constructor. The layer above doesn't say, I need a database so I can call the new operator on the layer below and pass in a database. It says, I need the layer below. Right? The layer above it has no clue about a database whatsoever. Let me give you a different example. Suppose you have a house. And the house has a door, and door all of a sudden, uh, door, door let's say has a doorknob. Okay, it's not that the new operator of the house calls the new operator of the door, which calls the new operator on uh, on the doorknob, and then the doorknob all of a sudden says, "I need an attribute called color." And now we have a problem, right? Now we have to pass the color all the way up. Instead, you have to structure the application differently. <clears throat> you have a house, and the constructor of the house says. I need a, a door. It doesn't say I'm going to call the new operator on the door. It just says I need a door. The constructor of the door says, well, I need a doorknob. And the constructor of the doorknob says, well, I need a color. And there's a separate class somewhere else called the factory <clears throat> that is not responsible for wiring all the pieces together. So the factory looks at the, the house and says, let me instantiate the house. Let me instantiate the uh, 
the door, let me instantiate the door knob, and it passes all the references around. And notice what happens. <clears throat> neither the house, nor the door, nor the door, uh, neither the house nor the door know anything about how the doorknob got instantiated, nor where its dependencies come from, nor about the fact that there is such a thing as a color. Right? So you have to have a simple rule that is, you don't mix object instantiation with your application logic, and in your, in your constructor, you always ask for what you need. So our credit card asks for the credit card processor. Our credit card processor asks for the offline queue, and the offline queue asked for uh, the database. The credit card didn't know about the database. Neither did the uh, credit card processor or the offline, well, the offline queue knew about the database, right? But only the, the layer that directly needs it, only the object that directly needs it knows about the object that it wants. So this is a very common myth, by the way, that a lot of people immediately when they look at dependency injection, that's exactly what they come up with. Uh, but all it means is that you did dependency injection halfway through. You didn't fully go all the way. Does that answer your question? So. All right. Did uh, you grab the microphone? For the house example, isn't it kind of inconvenient because house needs uh, thousands of things and you're going to pass, uh, create them in the factory and pass them as a parameter <coughs> to the constructor of the house? OK. So uh, if house needs a 1,000 things, then your house has a, a design problem, which is uh, it's mixing concerns or uh, too many responsibilities. You're violating too many responsibilities. Um, let me demonstrate. If I was to design a house, I would probably say something like, in the constructor of house, I need the living room, I need the kitchen, and I need the bedroom. And that's where I would leave it at that. I wouldn't say, in the constructor of the house, I need the wiring, I need the plumbing, I need the sink, I need so on and so forth, right? The constructor of the kitchen would say, I need the refrigerator and the sink and the plumbing. No, no, that's true. What I mean is that, um, I have a you know, dozen of members, right? Member variables, which mm -hmm. are not trivial, not ints. So now I have to expose them as a mem as a parameters to a constructor, all of them. Uh, well, if you before that it was you know this was a constructor with no arguments, and I was constructing okay. on the fly, right? Yeah. And so how did the how did the object get a hold of its uh, its collaborators? No, that, what you say we have to create them outside and just pass the ownership to the object, right? Okay. Is it uh, so? Is, I, is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, that, okay. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to understand this. So if, uh, if you have okay, let me back up a second. There's really two kinds of objects, and I'm struggling with a good name for them. There's the objects that do work, like service objects. Like in this, in our case, we had a credit card processor, offline queue, the database, right? These are your services. One way to look at them is you would never serialize them. Like if your application saves its internal state, you never save an internal state of, a, of an offline queue or a credit card processor, right? When you call, when you instantiate the application again, you make the new things. But you do save internal state of a credit card. Now, I call the credit cards kind of like the value objects. Forgive the name. I'm still struggling with that. And it is the service objects which do work. Now, for uh, a value object such as a credit card, it's perfectly valid to have a constructor that takes no arguments, and then you have setter and getter methods to set the, the first name, the last name, the, the credit card number, the expiration date, the, the bank kind, and so on and so forth, right? The reason it's OK is because the value object is really the, the end of the call graph, or the end of the extensiation graph. And like, there's nothing on the other side of it. Like, there, I mean, maybe the credit card is made up of address, but like, it's pretty much the end of it, right? Whereas if you look at the credit card processor, it's hardly the end, right? It talks to the offline queue, it talks to the database, database talks to the JDBC, JDBC talks to TCP IP, TCP IP has five, uh, five layers underneath it, finally goes to the wire, then there's a SQL server, then it has, like there's so many layers before you get to the hard disk, right? It's a completely different beast. And so in situations like those, you definitely want to ask for the, everything in the constructor. Now, if you have something like an offline queue, and the offline queue has, uh, uh, let's say it has 10 fields, 10 collaborators it collaborates with, then yes, you need to have 10 fields in your constructor. Now, if you look at it and you say, well, that's too many, well, then perhaps your offline queue has too much responsibility and you should consider about uh, breaking it off and saying, well, there's really the, the scheduler and there is the, the, the persistent storage, and really the offline queue needs to only take know about the schedule and the persistent storage. 
instead of trying to do everything and know about the database and the schedule and the parameters and all these pieces, right? It's, it's a, what the dependency injection makes, uh, gives you is it makes your dependencies explicit. It doesn't make it worse or better. It just says, this is what they are. And now most people freak out. They say, ah, it's too many. Let's blame dependency injection. Like, no, 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 no. The dependencies were always there. Whether you like them or not, you coded it that way. I just made it explicit. So if you don't like it, don't, don't blame dependency injection for that. It's you are the one who made these you know, 20 different collaborators that you collaborate with. And that's going to make it hard to test, by all means, yes, because now I have to mock out 20 different things. But the solution to that isn't to go back to our pretend there is no dependencies world. The dependencies are still there. It's just to structure our app differently. <clears throat> Hi, since we are talking about dependency injection, this more practical questions. Mm -hmm. um, basically, there is this framework that is used by a lot of people. Juice? And it's, no, it's, um, it's basically a um, scalar framework, which asks for a um, no argument constructor. Scalar framework? Scalar. It's basically a, some uh, map reduce. Oh, like a servlet. On a, a big table, yeah. So basically, us for a no argument constructor. Yes, yes, and that it makes it really miserably difficult to test. Yes, and I already thought that all the all the other classes, like I have a classifier, everything it asks for dependencies, mm -hmm. but I ended up newing this thing in the constructor of this whatever I'm mm -hmm. going to write at the last stage. It looks like this is in charge of the object graph, but that's not true because it actually does some work. Mm -hmm. So. Practically, what are you going to do to like yeah. fix this? So let's do a concrete example. Servlets are exactly what you're talking about. Servlets, AP, uh, servlet spec says you, the servlet has to have a no argument constructor. And that's a huge problem because clearly servlet has to talk to all kinds of things, gets all kinds of things done, right? How does it get a hold of these things? The spec doesn't say. And so what most people do is they have no choice but to use uh, singletons. <clears throat> but we know how much we hate singletons, right? So how do you get around this thing? Well, uh, first of all, many frameworks realized their mistakes and corrected it. So for example, if you use a, a GSE, which is our own internal Google Server Engine, or if you use Jetty, or uh, there's a couple other frameworks out there, they actually allow you to control the, the instantiation of, of uh, your, your classes, in which case you are responsible for calling the new operator and you can inject anything you want in there. So those frameworks realize their mistakes and they solve them. <clears throat> for the frameworks where they haven't solved it, uh, you are going to be forced to somehow get the information there through some kind of global state. But you need to separate this stuff out. Instead, what you're going to say is that the servlet's whole purpose is to isolate me from this horrible API. And the first thing the servlet does is it goes and grabs the singleton, which is usually the injector or some kind of a global service locator where all the objects can be registered. And the first thing it does is it delegates everything to a nicely dependency injection class. And then, because there's nothing inside of the servlet, it just all it does is it does the evilness of looking at the global state and passing it and then doing the, the nice stuff, you can totally test the rest of your application because the, the nasty bits are limited to this one area and they're only there because somebody screwed up the API. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So basically what you're trying to say is that uh, even though originally this whatever class I'm supposed to do is supposed to do some work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some kind of a double of this class and exactly. delegate everything down to. Everything is delegated I'm. on, and I can test this, and I can do all the good stuff that I normally do, dependency injection and everything. And then this, this horrible, poor class will become basically this ugly duckling that all it does is does the evilness of things that I try so hard not to do, but because it's forcing me, because somebody else screwed up, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do as little work in there as possible so that everything else can happen somewhere else. It's, it's basically a strategy from isolating yourself from bad, untestable API. Right, thanks. Yes? It still seems like there are situations where having global state is unavoidable. And I guess you know, he was pointing at this, but I mean, with web pages, you know, you, you, it's not like you, you can just somehow, I don't know, you don't have a main where you can just instantiate all the things you need and then have everything. Sure, yeah, if you have main, if you use Jetty, 
if you use a good servlet engine who doesn't insist to be the container and control the world, instead it gives you the control of the main method. Uh, so in the Jetty world, you have a main method, you instantiate Jetty, you register all the servlets, and you control the, control the instantiation. So in a world like that, you can totally do uh, what I'm saying. I think we're talking about different okay, things here, because I was thinking of like maybe an Ajaxy app where mm -hmm. it's, you have everything, almost everything happening on the client. There, it seems like JavaScript and everything So you're talking about like JavaScript much, problem, or? Yeah, I mean, it seems like you're pretty well forced to have well, some why kind of you, Why can't you do the same principles in JavaScript as well? If you have an object in JavaScript, why can't the object say, please pass all these references to me through the constructor? Sure. I mean, I think you can do a lot of this in there, but I, but it, it seems like there are there are some situations where you're you're not going to be able to escape because the thing is you already have a lot of global state just because of the DOM. Uh, like, yes, uh, but you need to separate yourself from it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a really hard time testing it. So you don't just have different methods reach in and to grab the DOM, which is the document in JavaScript, right, and manipulate it. Instead, instead, insist that all the objects that need to manipulate with DOM ask for it in the constructor. Oh, an interesting thing happens when you ask for it in the constructor, and that is uh, because methods ask for it, and you, you know if this one needs it, then the other factory will need it, and so on and so forth. Whenever you get to the situation where some method is asking for a document and you don't think it should, you, go, you can like step back and say, something's wrong over here, because in order to get its work done, it asks for a document, and I don't think it should know about document, therefore I must have made a mistake somewhere. So by doing these things explicit, you actually find that a lot of these weird dependencies come to light and you realize, oh, that dependency shouldn't be there and it's there. Whereas if you hide all the dependencies, all kinds of weird things happen and you don't know why. <coughs> okay, thanks. It, it is possible basically to build an application uh, purely without global state whatsoever, especially if you choose your technologies correctly, such as Jetty for web servers, uh, you know, and you have proper separation of dependency, uh, you know, of factories and, and so on and so forth. And you really get in the situation that uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that every object should only know about the, its direct collaborators. You should never be in a situation where you are asking for something that you don't, don't directly need. What it means is you don't dispatch any method on this object. You're only asking for it to pass it on to somebody else. Okay? That's the dead giveaway that something's wrong. Because uh, you should always only know about the objects that you directly need yourself. You never should be in a situation where you're asking for something just to, so you can give it to somebody else. Because when you're in that situation, what it really means is that object that you're passing it on to, you're either constructing it, in which case you're not supposed to be constructing, you're supposed to be asking for an instance in your constructor, or it means that uh, that guy, that object is supposed to ask for that object through its constructor, right? In each case, it's the same thing. It's, it, you, you don't want to know about things that you don't need to know about. Uh, that makes it really hard to, from a testing point of view. Any other questions? A comment from Road Office. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I I want to just add that I'm, I'm a big fan of having no singletons, and the reason is I work on a system infrastructure project where we have a lot of communicating servers that, that usually run on different machines. But if you want to actually crank them up in a single address space, and you want to put in a mock transport, uh, let's see, are we actually, you want to put in a mock transport, for example, uh, you, can't, you can't do that if there's, if there's global state because the two objects can't keep their state separate. Correct. So, so we actually are able to test a distributed application in a single Unix address space by creating several objects, pass each of them a mock transport, and then they all have their own completely isolated state. So I just want to put in another plug why you know not having singletons is a good thing. Right, yes. Uh... So you're agreeing with me, right? I'll just make sure we're on the same page. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. It, it isn't one of the one of the pieces of evidence you gave. You were saying, well, you know, you don't want to have more than you can. You can only have one application inside your JVM. And I'm saying we deliberately want to set up multiple copies of the application simultaneously running in the same address space. Correct. Correct. Um, I, I'd like to actually just add something to what you just said, and that is, 
Uh, suppose you have something like Jetty, which is a web server, which is a container for web servers, right? If Jetty internally had a global state, uh, then it would mean that I can only have one instance of Jetty running, uh, which can be okay for most of the applications, but what if I want to have an application running in a single JVM that serves uh, the users on port 80, but on port 8080, I have administrative UI where I can do some extra stuff that the users cannot do. In essence, I want to have two separate instances of Jetty, right? Can't do it if you have global state, exactly what you point out over there. So uh, yes, and the, the other way of looking at it is really every single test is a new application being instantiated, right? And so if you have singletons, like the game's over and you haven't even started testing, you can essentially have one test per JVM, and that's not very useful. So I, I'd like to make a, a meta comment about uh, global state. Uh, so yes. even the uh, if if you if you invoke static methods from class files, right? The whole class hierarchy, you know, Java lang, Java io, and so forth. That's that's really all static state. And the the existence of, of methods, you know, like system load library and and you know doing file io, all of that is is, is really rife with, with global state. And and I. I only know of one programming environment in, in existence that, that tries to systematically remove all of it so that you, know, you have a main method. It doesn't just get a list of arguments, it gets a platform. And the only way you can do, do I.O. is by calling methods on platform. Mm -hmm. right? or, or getting calling methods that will return you with uh, you know, file objects or you know, whatever on, um, on, on your, your platform mm -hmm. object. And that is the, uh, um, the, the new speak uh, uh, system that's derivative of small talk, but I don't think any, so every other programming language uh, is, uh, uh, around has some kind of notion of this, uh, there's some static state somewhere. Um, so in, in the real world, you, you can't get away from it. Uh, yes, but what you want to do is you don't want to make your application world worse, right? So you're absolutely right. Uh, there's tons of global state inside a JVM, whether you talk about class loaders, whether you talk about, uh, there's, there's just tons of it, right? Uh, but I don't have to test the JVM. I simply trust that the JVM works, right? But I have to test my application, and therefore I don't want to make my life more miserable than I, ha than I have to by adding global state into my application. Yes? Actually, as far as I know, um, although the JVM has this a lot of static global states, you could actually pass them as an interface. That means like, you know, if you want a date, you ask for a date, so I can pass you either a new date or whatever mock that I can pass. So same thing with math.random. Instead of using math.random, I can create a new random. Or even with system in, system out, I can pass a buffered reader, buffered writer yes. into the system, and that will work perfectly. And only my object graph actually needs to know about system in, system out, or whatever. Yes, right. but you have to code your application in a special way, right? Yeah, so the, the honest is on you, the developer, to code your application in such a way so that later you can test it. And global state is gonna really make your testing life miserable. All right, any more questions? Well, thank you guys for coming. It's great to see that there's so many people interested in how to write good testable code, and we'll see you guys next week. We have these every, every Thursday uh, at three o'clock. Um, and we also have uh, these cards on how to make your, uh, how, what to look for in, term, in testable code, uh, what to look for when you're doing code reviews to make the code a lot more testable. So if you guys want to have some of these cool co uh, code review uh, cards, stop by and I have a couple of copies with me and I can give you a copy. See you next week.